Hey. Hey. Sorry. How's it? Just, sent, just sent you a message. Oh, sweet. <laughs> How's it going? You're good? Oh, yeah. I'm just rushing around the floor for a change. <laughs> All good. Enough hours in the day. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Um, yeah, I really appreciate your time this morning, man. Um, yeah, don't worry about it. Been talking. Thanks for asking. Cool. Yeah, it's just... Uh, That's interesting. So in, during lockdown, I've just started a new project, really, mainly interviewing um, new bands and artists that I've got an interest in, um, but yeah. also also a few more more established artists like yourself. Um, and yeah, just finding a bit more about their background and, and where they're going with it, well, f- future projects yeah. and stuff like that as well. So yeah. Cool. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, Gary Powell from the Libertines, um, yeah, drummer, extra- <laughs> drummer extraordinaire. <laughs> Um, so Gary, yeah, go, uh, with guests so far, I've been going right back towards the, the beginning. Do you remember like, growing up when, um, uh, who were your early influences musically? Um, early influences musically, um, drumming wise, originally Cozy Powell. Okay, cool. Cozy Powell, yeah. Uh, nice. We did, um, I, mean, I remember just being a really small kid and my dad having his vinyl, and then it was a seven inch vinyl of a, of a um, tall ship, a yacht on its side, recorded at Rack Studios. And so I was, I was totally kind of like um, infused just by this image. I mean, it just looked amazing on the seven inch vinyl. Yeah. But then this record, it was just an accelerando of just him drumming, just going. Nice. <laughs> and I started doing that on my hands and it's the first thing that I learned. And then from then I just kind of like, um, it's, it's, it's really weird as well because the, um, what actually got me, I started drumming from a really young age. My, I, my, I didn't even, I, but I didn't actually get a pair of drumsticks until I was about nine or 10. Okay. But my, my dad got me um, this racetrack for Christmas, mm. an old, old 70s crappy piece of, piece of crap racetrack. And, uh, and on this racetrack, it had a bridge and this bridge was held up by two plastic prongs. And I ripped them out, I think on Christmas <laughs> day every day afterwards. And that became my drumsticks until, and I got that when I was about four and I used that until I was about eight or nine. That, that, they were my drumsticks. Oh, sweet. And so, so I just, I literally just, I, I literally just hit everything with that. I didn't have a kit, no, no, nothing. I'd have, I'd use my pillow at night. I, oh. You know, my dad would play records and I'd, and I'd pick my sticks up and I'd just start hitting things with, you know, with the sticks, pissing my parents off, obviously. <laughs> um, and then, um, but then after a while, I just, I, I just kind of got into other things, you know, you know, as kids do, I got into BM, riding, you know, I got into BMX biking, I got yeah. into skateboarding, I got into being, I got into mainly being a dickhead <laughs> and I kind of forgot everything else. But then in my teens, I heard a record by, um, which is the, the, the timing of you ask, asking this question with reference to Chikoria dying last week at the yeah. age of what, 70, 78? I mean, that just kind of, that just fucking blew my mind that Chick Corea died because mm-hmm. I heard a record, a friend of mine lent me a record called um, Eye of the Beholder. I'm on the record, I think it was Chick Corea playing um, piano. Um, I think it was Eric Marinthal or Frank Gamble on guitar, and Dave Weckl on drums. Okay. And I just heard this style of drumming that wasn't stereotypical to what I'd heard beforehand. You know, where every you know most records that we listen to is just kind of for, for, um, um, foot to the floor. Yeah, yeah. And but this was really textured and really coloured, and almost as if you took the music out, the drumming by itself would sing a song. And I just kind of got just got, and I just had this visual imagery of his hands just kind of going over all just everywhere, and yeah. his feet doing things, and just really textured, not just loud and bombastic, which I was used to. I mean, that's what I was used to. I was into loud, bombastic, or groovy music. I was into anything that just kind of just held it down, but nothing that was textured and kind of like went to place, went in different places. So then, that for me, that, that was that was a game changer, and I just started getting back into drumming. And um and then started checking out the likes of Steve Gadd and 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 oh god Akira Akira Jimbo and all of, yeah and all of these different drummers from all over the world yeah. and the different styles that I just hadn't actually been been like um but I just had I just hadn't heard anybody play like that before and, and that's really got what got me got me back into playing and and, and kind of really reaffirmed and infused 
my, my love of music, because I had a love of music. I mean, obviously I had a love of music. I was still listening to music all of the time. Yeah. You know, I was one of those grumpy teenagers that would, um, I'd walk home from school, save my money so I could buy comic books and buy stuff on my bike. And then I'd just lock myself in my room and play music, come downstairs, get some food, go back up to my room. Um, <laughs> and then my parents just wouldn't see me ever again. Go downstairs um, in the morning to do my paper rounds to get more money, walk to school, and then same all over again. And they just wouldn't see me because I was just one of a grumpy teenager that yeah. listened to music. Nick around my friend's house to listen to the Smiths, or was I supposed to be listening to the Smiths because I was into hip hop. And my friend Neil Edwards, he was into the Smiths, so I'd sneak around there at night and we'd just sit in the corner, just listening to the Smiths all of the time. But then the other guys I used to hang out with, it was like strictly 80s electro hip hop, you know, your Houdinis and your Run DMCs and, 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 Gun, and your Beastie Boys in the early days. Yeah, the Beastie yeah. Boys really infused my love of, of rock and roll, and um, especially rock and roll that grooved. Yeah, in the eighties, a lot of hair metal, um, a lot, a lot of, a lot of what I would call, without wanting to be rude, lame rock and roll, yeah, quite yeah. lame. <laughs> 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 nothing, nothing of real interest, nothing of stamina. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but the Beastie Boys kind of like changed that. And then you, you know, he started getting into, in, 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 into, into, into the hardcore scene, especially with being, especially with like being, being and when I was in Canada. So I do, I go on a lot. I do go on. When I was in Canada, when I was in Canada, I was staying at my uh, an uncle and aunt's in Canada, in this town called Moulton, Mississauga, just outside of Toronto, about an hour's bus ride outside of Toronto. And this is I must have been like sixteen then, sixteen seventeen, and then I was really getting into the hardcore scene then. But of my Robert Choda back in New Jersey, and we'd go to hardcore gigs in Staten Island when I was when I when I was in the states at that point in time. But I hooked up with a bunch of guys who I met at this place called the Eaton Center right in the heart of Toronto. It's where all the kids hung out. It was a cool spot. It was a shit spot, basically. It was a cool spot. And we'd go, we'd go there. I'd go meet those guys at night, late at night, nine o'clock. <laughs> nine o'clock at night. And we'd just like walk around with skateboards. Someone had a crappy little boom box and we'd play um, 24-7 Spies, um, Mucky Pup, um, Bad Brains, um, God, um, any, anything that was from the hardcore scene. And that yeah. really kind of like got yeah. me into, got, got me into, into, and into what would be deemed as hardcore. Cool. So yeah, but we're going back to your original question, <laughs> Cozy Pal. <laughs> <laughs> Cozy Sweet. Pal. That's so cool that um, that obviously you, you, you spent time in uh, Toronto. I was in Montreal for for a year, and there was an Eaton Centre there as well. Didn't quite do the same yeah, uh, yeah. same things, but yeah. Um, so <laughs> what was what was the um, did you move over to North America with family, or was that yourself, your your own choice, or family? Yeah, my yeah, most of my family live in New Jersey. Oh, I've got okay. family everywhere: New Jersey, Atlanta, Arizona. Um, I did um, I did I did um, um, an Insta live story thing with um, this drummer, um, Mike Dolbier, last mm. week. And we were chatting away on, on Instagram. And obviously, before that, I was trying to get it to hooked up on my uh, on my computer, but yeah. I can't get it hooked up on my computer because I'm a bit retarded. So I had it on my phone, and I saw all the things scrolling up. The next thing I saw, my aunt in Arizona was watching. I was like, "Yay, that's totally cool!" <laughs> Props to the family. Yeah, geez. <laughs> crazy. It's probably like nine a.m. over there, and you're over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. exactly. <laughs> um, so, so moving on from that, was there any like specific gigs or maybe a festival that you went to, maybe late teens that you thought, I, I don't want to be on this side of the barrier. I want to be up there on stage in a band, like doing my thing. Um, no, there wasn't. Okay, so it was mainly like the... <laughs> <laughs> no, it, there wasn't. But, I was, I was already kind of, I was, I was, I was, I was a bando in school. Okay, so I was always. Kind of playing music I was like kind of I did I did I did kind of like in in the states I, I kind of did the, the the bando circuit of the all the way down the east coast into the midwest just just kind of like touring around doing bando stuff oh, so nice. I was always on the road doing that my summer that, that was my summer months my summer oh, cool. months was with banding it and then I went and then I taught in Canada for a while once I once you know I and, and I did banding in Canada as well so I you know when I was in New Jersey I stayed with family in New Jersey um and then I band around there um, Ramapo um, school and Tidabra school that all, all that all that type of stuff and then I went up to um, up to uh, Kitchener Ontario mm -hmm. and I stayed with them um, with, with with some of the parents 
a band of a band that was with there, and then we did a band down the East Coast. You know, you know we, we would right. stay in, in in Canada, um, um, we did Toronto, down to Guam, and then 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 into Buffalo, New York, and then all the way down the I ninety five, down to Florida, and all in, into the Midwest a little bit, and then back across Peace Bridge, uh, um, in, 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 right uh, by Michigan, back into right. Canada, which would take us into into Montreal, and then, and then back into the back, in, back east again. And we, we 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 kind of did that circuit. So I was always kind of doing it, but the whole kind of like I ideology of like kind of being in a band per hmm. se and doing it like that never really crossed my mind never really crossed my mind I was always cool. about kind of like the education and and the learn and the learning of music that, that that was that 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 was where I thought my path would kind of lead to and I read that but then I realized I wasn't particularly that good at education <laughs> mm, <sure. laughs> so like oh yeah. crap so I'm not going to be I'm not going to be able to do that so what am I going to be able to do so then Obviously, like with all of the self doubt that I, I I had in my own ability, I started trying to I started trying to lay my um, put my hand towards other things because mm -hmm. I figured I'm, I'm you know I'm never going to be good enough to be um, to be Steve Gadd. I'm never going to be a Dave Wackle. Okay. And um, I don't know anybody within that circle that would actually allow me the opportunity to be like that. At my grandmother's house in New Jersey, we didn't have a drum kit. At my parents' house, I didn't get a drum kit until late on at my parents' house. So you know, it's just kind of like, how do I gain the ability to be the person that I actually want to be because you can't just do it in school I can't just like um go to so it was yeah drumming camps for me what was more band camps were um every two weeks and okay. then I'd go to uh, Teterboro High School in Teterboro New Jersey for a weekend and then we'd learn all of the music and then we'd move in to Ramapo New Jersey um like a month before we go on tour learn the rest of the music and then we'd be on tour banding that was it Cool. Um, there was no kind of like real like drumming, like a drum kit kind of like education. I, I, I didn't really have that. So the ideology of me kind of like wanting to be like in a band playing, playing kit in a band just wasn't, you know, even with school and stuff, it was kind of like it was it was um, third stream jazz and jazz and stuff and just sitting down sight reading music. And, you know, that, 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 that was that, 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 that was my background. Yeah, um, so, and it wasn't until cool. later on when when I eventually ran out of money and came back to England, and it was like you know I, I was just like, well, I want to keep on playing music. So mm. we started goofing around with different bands and stuff, and yeah. the next I was in a band in Essex for a period of time. I can't, I can't even remember what they were called. Never played any shows, but they were they were very much like Primal Scream. So it was All a right. lot of fun, and I and I got I learned a lot of chops from those guys. So I learned a lot of chops playing with those guys, and then I was in a band elsewhere kind of like more like um jeff buckley very kind of like 90s grunge garage with but a lot more harmonious a lot more dynamic mm -hmm. um and then i was in a band before i was in the libs i was in a band called the minor birds and that was just straight up like sound garden um pearl jam ask um yeah. a lot of a lot of good fun it was it was good fun yeah. playing with those guys but it just didn't have the same kind of like dynamic mm -hmm. when you get the you know outside yeah. outside of, yeah it's all about the chemistry you know the chemist not just the chemistry on stage or in rehearsal you know once you put the instruments down where's the chemistry where mm -hmm. you know because a lot of the times with 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 a band with an ensemble with an outfit whatever you, what you want to call it all of the magic happens when you put the instruments down that's okay. that's 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 when you can actually cultivate something really really good because it's about as you said, the chemistry that you have with all of the people that you're at, that are around you. If there is no chemistry, then what you actually end up having is something that you may you may come up with a great idea, but it's but it's it's a little bit sterile. Mm. It's yeah. it's one it's two dimensional. It, it comes from one particular viewpoint, and you will always end up with something that is that that is a little bit better, unless of course you're an amazing songwriter like the right like. like Quincy Jones, like Prince, like like the individual members of Queen, like the Beatles, individual great individual songwriters that can see the bigger picture and then can actually present it to people, and you can all kind of like bring in your two cents. Unless you're that type of person, yeah. then yeah, it's amazing. But <laughs> if you are just coming from a, a one particular individualistic viewpoint, it's always it, you know it may be good, but it will always be a little bit two dimensional. Yeah, for sure. And so with, as you, you've kind of touched on a bit of your background there, but uh, so you met, you kind of had a mutual friend with the Libertines, was that correct? Was that some sort of management person? And then he introduced you yeah. to like Pete and Carl? Yeah, you, yeah. You, um, sorry, go on. 
Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, do you remember like some of the fond memories of them early days when, when you met them and, and you're in the band, the early, early shows and stuff like that? Yeah, they, they, they were obviously the best memories because we were bright eyed and bushy tailed and this, it was all very, very new to us. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we played we played a few shows prior to actually being signed and, and, and stuff. Not particularly that many, because uh, because I'm because I'm sure you possibly already know there was a previous incarnation, a previous sorry, incarnation of the Libertines before I joined. Yeah, and then that right. filter yeah. pieces have dissipated. Um, mm -hmm. John was in that original um, original um, conglomerate, and there was Mr. Rascox <clears throat> on drums. Um, there was um, well, I can't remember a name, but the cello player. There was um, Scarborough Steve, he was the lead singer. But slowly, one by one, for whatever reasons, they all left. John was the youngest in the band. He wanted to do his A-levels, so fair enough. He, had to, he, wa he wanted to finish off his education. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rascox was a little bit older. I think he started to get a little bit kind of delusional with the direction that everything was going, and, and he left. And one by one, as I mentioned, they, they all kind of left the band. And at, at that point in time, I was working directly for East West Records. And I was playing for Eddie, Eddie Grant. And the business affairs manager um, was a woman called Banny Pucci. And she just taken on managing Pete and Carl. So we, I was, I, I'd met her a few times because that's where I was getting paid directly from East West Records. So I, I had to have some form of kind of like um, relationship with her. And she was like, I've got a couple of guys I want you to meet. Yeah, do you want to come down to a, come down to a pub by mine? And she lived around the corner for me. And I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds fun. Why not? And um um, she took me to Filthy McNasty's, which I used to go to anyway. So okay, I'm just yeah. like, oh. And then she pointed at Pete and Carl, and I was like, I see these guys in here all of the time anyway. And they were like, oh, all right. And then we just started talking. Carl was the first first to say anything. He said, oh, have you, have you ever had a, have you ever drank a David Nivens? And he often preferred me this drink that looked like the most ranked drink in the entire world, but it was like rocket fuel, obviously, okay. because Carl gave it to me. And, um, and we just started talking then. And initially it, would, it had, it, you know, it, it had nothing to do with like, um, let's use the terminology grooming. There was yeah, no yeah. grooming involved with regards to, oh, we can get this guy into the band. Because at that point in time, they had no band. It was just Pete and it was just Carl. That was it. There was Pete okay. and Carl. Oh, and Johnny Burrell as well. Johnny Burrell, he kind of like popped in and said, oh, you're right, that's the first time I met Johnny Burrell as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then after, after a few, a few other meetings, just kind of like hanging out, because obviously we, we, we had, um, we, we had a likeness for, for this, for, for a few of the same things mm -hmm. musically. And they were just great guys. And they were just, a, just a really, really good laugh. And I enjoyed hanging out with them. And at that point in time, all I was doing was working. I, there wasn't, I was going to jam sessions in Clapton. I was going to the jazz cafe. I was working with Eddie Grant. I had a, I had a crappy little part-time job to, to, to make ends meet. The, the, you know, the idea of just kind of like meeting up with friends and going to hang out, there weren't particularly that many. There were. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, having a circle of my own of people who just wanted to hang out who were like-minded was like, yeah, that's totally cool. That was awesome. So we started hanging out then. And then a few a few weeks after that, they just said, why don't we just go into the studio and just jam out some ideas? And that's where it all kind of began. Nice. That's so and again, cool. it kind of, you know, again, it was all it was all about the chemistry post play. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was about, you know, we jam out ideas and it'd be like, oh, that's a good that, that was good fun. Let's go to the pub and 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 have a drink. Mm. and a ciggy uh, and, 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 and a chat about all types of nonsense. And that's exactly what we did. We'd go to pubs in, um, in Old Street, um, Old Street in, in London. We'd go to um, Charlie Wright's International. And we'd sit down and we, we, you know, between us, we didn't have a pot to piss in. We didn't have particularly that much money. And um, we, we created, um, the guys created things like Christmas curlies because we, because we, we, we could may, may possibly just afford a pack of cigarettes between us. So mm. we'd get a cigarette each. And we'd kind of try to bend the cigarette as much as we possibly could do. So we'd just sit there quietly, just bending cigarettes. And then, and it was about who could bend the cigarette the most. And like between us, sometimes we could get a complete a cigarette completely bent around <laughs> facing you. And then just sit there smoking it. And you could see people just watching us like, what are they doing? And we'd literally just be just bending, just like nurturing <laughs> these cigarettes and just kind of completely bend. And then just sit down like this. And we'd have all of these cigarettes pointing in weird, weird directions. Just like, <laughs> Jesus. It's hilarious. It was good fun. It was really, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was fun. It was good. It was, it, yeah, it was a lot good. of fun. For sure. Do you remember um, specifically like your first, your first gig with the guys? Like, well, uh, actually I'll, I'll say your first gig after the after the first album had dropped so 
So like you, so so you, so you'd had a bit of momentum by then. Maybe like the 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 word had got around the country and stuff like that. Um, I don't know because it was it was it was the whole kind of like promotional campaign. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm not even I'm not I really cannot remember the pr yeah. promotional campaign as put together by Rough Trade Records. So like okay. props is due to Jeff Travis and Jeanette and James Endicott, all of those guys at Rough Trade. They they kind of like work worked hand in hand with the enemy. Mm. And once we got once we got signed, and I think the record was about to drop, we we kind of like did um we did we we did an a, a little kind of underground support tour where we weren't the libertines. We were we were we went under a pseudonym. We were Lombard Lombard Spaniel and Roundtree. No Spaniel Spaniel Lombard and Roundtree. What am I talking about? Okay. Spaniel Spaniel Lombard and Roundtree, and and we and we we just we we toured around these little venues and getting as much get, get, getting used to playing as much as we possibly could do because we hadn't we we'd been together for a short period of time mm -hmm. um and we and we and, and on the basis of playing one show at the ribbon factory when we turned up with one guitar we had to borrow a bass guitar i didn't have a drum kit um so we had to borrow a drum kit from somebody else and i didn't see the drum kit until the gig and the drum kit was already set up at the Ribbon Factory in Whitechapel. And it was this horrible, well, I'm not going to say horrible because that because it got assigned. It was this huge drum kit, really, really big. Um, not as in the amount that was on it, it was just it was just just a huge drum kick bass. Yeah, yeah. And a massive to one massive tom here and a massive tom there. And and then the hi hat symbols was like 25 inches. It was just like, what the hell is this? It's massive <laughs> snare. But I'm I'm just like, I I've got nothing. Mm. I've literally got a flat to live in, so I cannot complain. Symbols were put, put together on this metal frame, this handmade metal frame, and they were hanging from bits of rope. So you hit Crazy. symbol and it would just swing, <laughs> just swing. So I spent my time playing the show. And the first thing that we played at the opening of the show was horror show, which is all symbols and absolutely everything. So I spent my time, as soon as we started playing, I'd hit a symbol doing this. I spent my time doing this, trying to dodge symbols. Trying to dodge, I was dodging things, it was hitting me. Then sticks broke. And then all of a sudden we, a, a guitar string broke. We had no, um, no, we had no backup guitar strings, no backup guitars. We had absolutely nothing. James wow. Endicott from Rough Trade was there. And and we we played horror show. We went. We started playing something else, and then and then Pete just went. Um, oh, we we were a three piece by this point. Okay. It was just me, Pete, and Carl. John hadn't really joined the band by then. Um, it's just just the three of us. And so Pete and Carl were swapping bass duties between the two of them. And uh, <laughs> and we we start. I can't even remember what we started playing. We started playing something else, and the guitar string broke. And Pete went, um, sorry. Anybody, <laughs> anybody got any strings? <laughs> so the gig had to stop for a while until we got Jeez. another string. And then it takes them ages to um, change the yeah, strings. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And then the gig carried on. And we I think we played for another 20, 25 minutes. But it took about another 20 minutes in order to get the string. Um, <laughs> so the gig went on for ages. And it was it just ended up being a really, really good laugh because it was all of, all of our friends from Philfish, they came down. A few other people that they knew, they all came down as well. And it was just a, re it was just a really nice vibe, a nice burst, which predominantly were all of the shows that we did in the early days and um and James Endicott was there and he and he saw this and I think he liked what we played he, he came to um a session at Rue Studios in Old Street and obviously we played a lot more there and I think he's he I think he saw the potential but I think yeah. what he saw was kind of like this almost hippie-esque this hippie-esque environment of people who were all kind of like like-minded yeah. not just people turning because they like the songs and they like the band and they can kind of sing along. It was, it, it was like a little community, mm -hmm. just a little community of like-minded people. Cool. And I think he saw that. And off the back of that, he just went, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to sign you guys. And we're just like, seriously, we've, we haven't even played anything. We haven't played a show. We've just kind of, it was sounded terrible, but yeah. it didn't do anything to him. So on, so on from there, so on from there, I think one of the first things we did, I mean, well, I mean the first major thing, I remember us doing was supporting the Strokes. Okay, and was that in the UK or was that away? That was in the UK. There yeah. was two shows in the UK: at Leeds University, <clears throat> and then at the, I think it was at the uh, Academy or the Hummingbird or something in Birmingham. Okay, nice. Was, and that was the one of that was the first major thing that we did supporting those guys. That's um, cool, and that, that that was great. That was that, that was great. For sure, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. What would you say um, the main difference is between, like, I suppose, like the UK 
crowds and like North American. Is it is there a big difference? Like, would you say like I don't know? Say in your early years, you were you were touring a lot over there, and um, yeah, would you say there's yeah, a big a big? Because for me, it feels like when I've been to a Libs gig or any con kind of concert in the UK. It seems a bit more rough and ready in, in the UK and over there it seems a bit more glamorous and stuff like that. Like, I don't know. If that's... Oh, I, was just about to, I was just about to throw this right back at you. What is the big difference between British people and American people? Probably that as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. People are a little bit more rough and ready. <laughs> we are. British people are very much laissez faire. That's, I mean, that, that, is, that is predominantly why we live in a society, we have the society that where we have right now. You know, we still obviously Britain still has its problems, it still has its problems, and oh, there's still sure. things that we need to we need to figure out in this country. But generally speaking, British people are a little bit more like meh, why have bothered, don't really care, I'm gonna have some fun. Whereas in America, things are a little bit more, it's a little bit more kind of contrived, it's a little bit more controlled, it's a little bit more defined. You know, mm. people have their place, people have to act their place. I mean, that is why there is a virgining middle class. They call it the middle class. It ain't no middle class. It's no, it's no different to, to, to the working class over here, but it's the middle class there. Mm. Everybody's, everybody's prescribing to a particular way of life. You know, there's, there's, there's definition to, to what they do. There's definition to whom they are. There's definition to what they believe. Over here, we're just a little bit more kind of meh. Yeah, exactly yeah that, we're just yeah. a little bit more kind of meh. What are you it, into? Oh, I'm into this. Oh, cool, what else? Yeah. <laughs> So, so we're in, in England, in Great Britain, sorry, we're allowed, we, we're, we are afforded the opportunity to let our hair down a little mm. bit. I say this, not having any hair on my hand. We're afforded <laughs> the opportunity to let our hair down and just be who we want to be. Yeah, that's in so the that's... States, in the States, you kind of not, not really. Mm. Land of the free, home of the brave? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's funny because uh, I actually watched an interview with Kings of Leon the other day and um, Jared Followell, the, the bassist, he, he was asked, um, what, what's one of your favorite things about coming to the UK? And he says, I just love how if, if people want to go for a pint on their lunch break at 12 in the afternoon, they're not, they're not going back to work and getting frowned upon for doing it. In the US, it's like, what? But um, <laughs> here, here in the UK, if you want to go for that, if you don't, fair enough. But if you do, it's not like a big thing. Like, So yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's very, very true, like you say. Yeah. Um, Gary, what would you, it's probably a, a, a bit of a curveball question, maybe, or totally different, but what, what advice would you give for any like, you, curveball, like yeah, let's go. Throw that curveball like. <laughs> what, would you, what, um, what advice would you give for any up and coming bands or artists that are trying to, trying to make it in, this, in the music industry? Ah, that's no curveball question. That's, you know, the, the, the answer to that would be no different with reference to whether we are in a global pandemic in lockdown or not. Um, the one thing that I would suggest is, uh, is try to be as much of yourself as you possibly can do and stick to your guns regardless of which. If you, the more and more you become a facsimile of something else, no matter how good it actually sounds, no matter how much initial acclaim you get from being that facsimile you will always ever just be a facsimile of something else and then there's only so far you can actually go with it mm, true, because yeah. they will all because people will always want to listen to the original more than they will want to listen to i mean say for instance if, you know if you know if you were if if a record of ours came on and it sounded um, in the early days they, they kind of did it sounded very beatle-esque you can be pretty much guaranteed that once listening to that record, most people would then eventually put on the Beatles records and listen to a heck of a lot more Beatles than they would of us because mm. of the the because of the um, the obvious the the ob the obvious permutations with reference to. You just kind of it's 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 about it's about finding your own voice, and so I I, I would suggest find as much of your own voice as you possibly can do. Don't watch TV shows like The Voice. I, I, I don't have a problem with them. I, I watch them with my kids because it's, yeah, yeah. it is kind of, it, it, it is kind of and, fun. And and some, some, yeah. some of the people in there, they got, they got, they got, they, you know, they do have obvious talent. They've got great voices. Um, I disagree with the judging panel yeah. um, in its entirety. Um, I, I, I kind of do. I don't care. Yeah, um, for sure. Like, like, will, will I am um, whomever. I'm like, sorry, I, I kind of disagree with, 
you know, your, your path. Their path is purely on the basis of we need to, we need you to project more because so and so sings like this. It's not about bringing out the best in that individual. Mm. It's about bringing out the best in the individual so they sound more like what they are normally akin to. And I'm like, I, I'm not interested in it. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in all of the foibles and, and you know, the, the, the curveballs that can be thrown at you from, from a different approach in play, being, being played in music. I've got, mm. you know, I've got my own radio show, Boogaloo Radio, I've got my yeah. own radio show. Yeah. And one, one of the records that I just absolutely love playing is, um, it's, it's an old record, it's Nick Radigan. Um, okay. he, he did his um, Current Joys and New Flesh. Absolutely love that record. Yeah, absolutely nice. love New Flesh because it, it is just, it goes, it, not just because it goes against the grain of everything, but it's because it fits together so so perfectly. There's no bass guitar on it. Um, the 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 the, the, <laughs> the, okay. the, 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 the guitar sounds are absolutely genius in there. Um, he he doesn't follow the status quo with reference to what the the makeup of the song should be. Like a ver or what intro verse or intro double verse chorus. Um, a little break in there. Verse chorus. Um, middle eight, <laughs> verse, <laughs> chorus, out. That's what yeah. everybody does. Every, everybody does that. Everybody yeah, yeah. follows the standard routine with reference to how you should actually write a song. Mm. Personally, I'm like, you follow the route of what the song is. And if the song doesn't take you in that particular direction, you should be allowed to actually traverse whatever path that song takes you down in order to create something that is really, really individualistic and you, because what yeah. you want, not a record that does well now. You want a record that in five years time, somebody puts on, you want them to listen to it and you want them to be taken back in time to the original feeling of what that song was or for it to actually create something new for, you know, the, idea, the idea, ideology of listening to something. And every time you listen to it, you hear something new. There's something new that pops out. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I had no idea that was it. That's great. And it makes you want to, makes you want to listen to it even more. Yeah. If we listen something because it sounds like something else eventually you're going to stop listening to it true yeah it just sounds like something else why do you want to listen to that when you can listen to the original so <laughs> i'm just like be as be as individualistic as you possibly can do and do take on as much advice as you possibly can because there is one thing as well i might be talking absolute crap so good i might you, 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 what you have to do is have as much advice as you possibly can do, have as much information, because information is going to be key. And we're in a point in time right now where you don't need, you, your chances are you don't need a record label, not to, not to massively push you. You don't need to sign a major deal. Yeah. What you actually need is what all of the fundamentals that are around you. You need good people that are around you. I mean, if you are young, if you're at university, if you're at college, you are bound to know um, other guys to be in a band with. You're bound mm -hmm. to know um, somebody who's who's into filming you're bound to know a photographer you're bound to know somebody who's into marketing and promotion you can actually do all of that yourself yeah yeah for sure you, you can put a team of people around you and do it yourself so you have all of the power so yeah. I, I i would i would stick with getting as much knowledge as you possibly can do and then create an environment around you that is indicative of what you're actually trying to portray. And that's not just the music that goes to, as I said, once you put the instruments down, who's around you, who are you going to be talking to, who's going to be infusing ideas and not just about the music, you know, the, the overall direction that the project is taking, mm -hmm. because if you are being serious about it, it's not just about music, it's a business. Yeah. Yeah. True. And the, le and the more you actually start thinking like it's a business and play and put yourself in control of the overall framework, then the more longevity that you will actually have. I mean, Sweet. one of the, I, I, do, I do go on, sorry. I'm no, sorry. I, I'm, I'm loving this answer. It's really cool. It's, I love it, yeah. One of, the, one of the things that really annoys me specifically about this country is, is the fact that this country is so, so creatively orientated. So many great creative people, young people in this country, 16 year old creative people who are, who are making great art, great graffiti, great music, great poetry, great, you know, great whatever. They're, they're doing it. But say, for instance, we use a model of a musician, 16 year old musician, sets up a band with his mates, playing in his, playing in his garage at home or at school, 
um, the band gets really, really good, start to play a few shows, the friends turn up, um, you know, it's all really, really, really good fun. Then some dickhead from a record label turns up, or an A&R artist turns up, and I'm like, they look at the instrument, look, look around and they go, wow, this is really, really cool. I want to sign these guys. That, that, those 16 year olds get signed. The next thing you know, that bit of fun that they have, mm. playing music with the friends, have, hanging out with the friends, that becomes a business. And that yeah. whole mentality of friendship and fun goes out of the window with, with an A&R artist, with a manager, with a possible lawyer who then looks at who's actually writing the material. So whomever is writing material, they get offered the most money. The band originally may have said, oh, no matter whatever happens, you know, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed, no matter what happens, we're going to go in this together. We're going to split everything 50 50. We're all, it's going to be down the middle, everybody. Yeah. But then a lawyer says, wow, you guys have been writing amazing. We're going to offer you 300,000 pound for a publishing deal. The lead singer goes, oh, it's amazing. And because you would all of the writing, we're going to give you the lion's share of the publishing deal. But don't worry, the rest of the guys will be taken care of. Of course, the lead singer, 16, 17 years old, is going to go, oh, my God, yes, that's, that's amazing, fantastic. Yeah, sure. And we're always going to be taken care of as well. In actuality, they're not going to be taken care of because originally you said it was going to be a 50-50 split. Taken care of, 50-50 split means money goes equally. So if there is no arguments, there's no arguments about money, there's no arguments about who's in the limelight more, none of that happens. That is the prime reason why most bands split up. Money yeah, and sure. who's, who's in the limelight, who's getting all of the credit. When everybody, when when you work in the studio and you're putting a song together, no matter if, even if you put a tr even if you just play a triangle on that track, you are actually adding to the framework of that song. You are an important integral part because it goes on the record. Mm. Why are you dismissed? Yeah, that is yeah. the problem with rock and roll in this country. So what you will find is you'll be 16, 17 years old. You'll get signed. You sign a two-year deal, something of that nature. You go on tour for the, the, the first year when you can go on tour. It's sort of a fucking global pandemic you go on tour the record doesn't do as well as it should do now this a and r artist who came to see you <clears throat> he's now getting pressure from his bosses we put a shitload of money into this band um mm. publishing company as well oh my god we're not getting a return there's no return on this we're gonna have to sack it up get rid of it all of a sudden you've 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 been signed at 17 you've toured for one year you got dropped at the age of 18 you are now redundant owing yeah. a shitload of money <clears throat> 18 years old got no job what does that do to your confidence what does that do to your mental health how many bands are, are there out there that have, that have been promised everything in mm. the entire world only for them only for it then to be dragged away from them because of what what it actually comes down to is a lack of faith a lack of intelligence financially and a yeah. lack of ability to actually steer around all of the around all of the bad times to actually propel this project into a direction that it should go in. Because obviously it's never going to work straight away. It's always yeah. going to take a little bit. And you need somebody with the guts to be able to say, okay, that didn't work. We're gonna we're we're gonna do this again. We're not gonna put as much money into it this time because obviously we can't afford to, but we need to really reevaluate what went wrong with it. Was it the record? Was it the look? Was it the marketing? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do to change in order to actually make this work for everybody that's involved? That doesn't happen enough. Yeah, that's uh... so. I so for for a new young band, I'd say control your own ship. Yeah, Don't yeah. take any anybody else. Control your own ship and get as many good people around you as possible. Be equal. Be fair, and 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 do it for the love of doing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I love that. I love that answer. I love the detail on it as well. It's class. Um, sure. With um, with yourself musically. So obviously you've got the radio station going. Um, can you see any, any more work with Libertines coming forward maybe next year or so on or any, anything else like yeah. of, of that nature? Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah we're, we're, we're definitely looking at look, look, looking at um, looking at and bringing out more music. Carl is um, he's doing a solo project at the moment. Mm. I think Pete's been working with some French dude. He wants to do another solo project. John's working on something. I've got my own solo project that I'm working on as well, which, which oh, is nice. completely different. It's yeah. Completely, not just musically, but in the, but in the overall approach, it's, it's just it's just completely different. So so we're all doing something um, musically. I mean, once again, you know, um, 
to coin a phrase written by the boys, um, if you've lost your faith in love and music, what's well, one thing that we haven't lost? We're just really kind of busy. We're just yeah. busy. And we, and, we, and, we, and we have spoken about it the last time we saw each other. Um, was it some stage? It was last year mm-hmm. in the... Um, Prior to what was supposed to be the circuit breaker, we all met in the, in Margate and we were talking about it then. Yeah, we need to get back together. Pete Carr, Pete specifically was like, I'm dying to get back into the studio. I've got some ideas when I, when I, get, when I get some stuff done. But yeah. unfortunately, the time and the distances between us and then obviously just how busy we all are, it's just kind, kind of got in the way of everything. Yeah. But are we going to get back into the studio to do some more stuff? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Health and um, British government willing, yeah. Nice one. Perfect. Um, Gary, with, with um, my guests so far, um, I've been doing a little quick fire round to finish off. Is it okay to, to crack on with some quick fires? Uh-oh. <laughs> they're, all, they're all good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, Hit me. First one up. Uh, would you rather be at home or on the road? Oh, that's a tough one. Quick fire. Um, at home. Cool. Yeah, family man, obviously. Maybe, maybe a bit different. 20, oh, well, family 20. man, but yeah. I got everything I need here. I got yeah, a no, studio. Looks it. Looks like. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, up north or down south? Down south. Cool. Um, music wise, the UK or the USA? Oh, the UK. Cool. Um, would you rather be by the ocean or by the mountains? Ocean. Cool. Um, would you rather be on the beers or on the wine? <laughs> it's really funny. I I'm, again, I do go wine. I I can drink a bottle. Of, I well, I used to drink a bottle of whiskey a day. So okay. I stopped doing that now. But you put two beers in front of me, and that's it. I'm ruined. I cannot okay. drink beer. I don't like the taste of it anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, spirits, baby. Hit me with the spirits. Good. I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you say like, whiskey is more your tipple then? Yeah. If, if you're on tour or whatever. Or... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. cool. Yeah. Um, my missus for, for, for Valentine's Day, she bought me, my missus for Valentine's Day bought me a huge whiskey decanter. Oh, nice. A beautiful, massive whiskey decanter. Cool. So it just sits in the kitchen now. Whenever I just walk in there, I can just like pour myself a little tipple. <laughs> this one of these things back here is just full, full of booze. Nice. Um, would you rather be playing arenas yeah. or festivals? Oh yeah, show me. Arenas or festivals? I'll oh, go in and I'll show you. Yeah, show me. Crack on. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if you can. See. Oh yeah. Oh just yeah. For the, just for the. Good man. That's just that's studio booze. That's a... Studio booze, baby. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, and what was the next question? Arena? Or... Would you rather be playing arenas or festivals? Um, between the two, I'm. God, that's a tough one. I am festivals, I'm guessing. Yeah. Cool. No arenas, because uh, arenas would be our show. Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, it's kind of a kind of a generic question. You've probably heard it a, a million times, but um, the Beatles or the Stones? Beatles. Cool. Um, Beatles. My mom's my mom's a massive Stones fan, but yeah, we supported we, when I was with the Specials. We supported the Beatles. We support we supported the Beatles. No, when I was with the Specials, we supported the Stones. Oh, nice. So I'm nice. glad to see them. Um, met. Them. I, I, I already knew um, Keith and um, Keith Richards and. Um, and which was which was fun, and and it was fun to take my mom and dad to see the show as well because my mom's a huge Stones fan. Yeah, so sure. she said my mom was in heaven. Was was that yeah. a, a couple of years ago? Yeah, the tour. Or, a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah, because I, I went to yeah. I went to the Stones at Wembley Stadium and they had Florence and the Machine down there for the day I was there. But where, where were you in Coventry or were you at the Rico Arena? Coventry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rico Arena, that's the one. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Great, yeah. What, great show. What a tour, man. Yeah. They're still going for it now at that old age as well. Great lads, Stones. Um, yeah. If you could watch any band from past or present, uh, alive or dead, and you get to meet the artist afterwards and just maybe like pick their brains half an hour or so, who would it be? 
Oof. Off the top of my head, it'd probably be the MC5. Cool. Because I know um, with the MC5, I could get an N into Parliament and Funkadelic, which nice. covers all of my bases, basically. Yeah. They used to all hang out. Yeah. Which is amazing. It's, you know, if you, if you go back in time, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, the Beatles is one thing, and they were very kind of like um, all encompassing with reference to whom they hung out with. And they, you know, they, they didn't really care. They only, they played, when they played America, they, they um, one of the reasons they went into America was because they made sure that every single gig they played was, wasn't was segregated. You know, yeah. you, anybody could turn up yeah. to that show, which at that point in time was was still was st was still a thing in the States. And, but they made sure that it wasn't a segregated show because they just weren't used to that. But for me, the fact that um, the MC5 and Parliament and Funkadelic yeah. were, they, they, all, they, they came from the same area, they're all they were from Detroit and they hung out all of the time and they influenced each other. I mean, it just reminds me of like, um, it kind of reminds me of, of Us With The Lips where we go, go to Charlie Wright's International and, and some of the, um, the a bar down, down by Elm Street and the, some of the guys that would be just down there as well. It would, you know, um, it, it would, it, yeah, it, that, 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 that vein of thinking for me, yeah, cool, I, yeah. I, I kind of dig that. It's funny, um, maybe about two or three interviews ago, I, I spoke to a guy from Cambridge, GSD, and um, he said Parliament as well. He said Parliament in their peak, yeah. so um, yeah. Obviously, huge um, influence on a lot of people, and just they just yeah. obviously had a great, great fucking time doing it as well, didn't they? <laughs> fucking time, but you know, but but equally as influenced by the MC Five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were just ram a lammering it, but you know that they influenced each other, which I think is just absolutely specifically at that particular point in time when there was so much social injustice, political rife going on in the country. I mean, it's in the States, something like that. You could see that happening in England. You could see that happening in England, but in, in America, in Detroit, you know, the, the car industry is slowly dissipating. People are slowly leaving the city because of a lack of like financial infrastructure being, mm -hmm. being, being created and nurtured within, within the city of Detroit. And you've yeah. got these guys who are um, live in segregated um, Detroit hanging out with <laughs> hanging out with these guys and they're just like they're just all over each other just having a great time and they don't give a fuck what anybody thinks and i'm yeah. just like that yeah. is just awesome so yeah that, that i'm guessing that would be a bit for me yeah that must have been a crazy crazy time so obviously it was like one of the like richest cities in the world wasn't it and like had so yeah. much uh, manufacturing obviously with ford and, yeah. and general motors or whatever and um and it just all instantly went yeah uh yeah. next next up i've got um John Lennon or Bob Marley? Bob Marley. Nice. Um, and then finally, to round it off, um, if you're forced to get up on stage and do a, do a song for karaoke, what would be your karaoke song? <laughs> what would be my karaoke song? Wow. Woo. If I could do it, would probably be, um, if I could play it on the piano, probably. Um, Billy Joel, New York State of Mind. Oh, wow. Some folks like to get away, take a holiday from the neighborhood, hop a flight to Miami Beach or to Hollywood. I'd do that one, yeah. Nice, Great nice, song. nice, nice. <laughs> oh, I love it. Gary, I appreciate your time today, mate. Um, I know it's been, I know you're a busy man, but I really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks Absolutely. a lot. My uh, pleasure, my pleasure. And good luck with it all. Keep me posted. Um, yeah, fantastic. Great meeting you, Jack. Cool. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe, man. You too. Stay safe. Stay sane. Catch you later. Listen to Boom Radio. I will do. <laughs> Cheers, man. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you. See you later. Bye.